a rebuilt Stuart Major beam engine in the workshop. In a previous video I showed two examples of Stuart Major beam engines. Unfortunately this one was not right and was rebuilt to correct some errors. This video is edited using clips from a series I made called Stuart Major Beam Engine Rebuild and the complete series is well worth watching. By moving the bearing about I can change the concentricity slightly of the flywheel but initially it's not looking good it really does feel like it's not a tight fit on the crankshaft to start with and the same goes for the pulley wheel that's wobbling about also plus it appears to have been slightly over machined there isn't too much material left to remove if I do need to true up the flywheel so for now I'll just nip up the bearing so that it doesn't work completely loose and drop off and now again as you can see as I tighten down the bearing the concentricity of the flywheel gets worse I'm going to have the whole thing in pieces and have a close look at it in due course. The cotter pins come out very cleanly. There's no bodging, they fit perfectly. And the squareness of the holes has to be seen to be believed. These parts are so well made, I'm having to use a hammer and a small piece of brass to release them even when the cotter pins are withdrawn. So at the moment this engine puzzles me. The machining is to a high standard particularly the smaller parts as you see here but when the thing goes together it's a bit of a disaster area maybe the person who machined this engine was not the person who put it together who knows everything on this engine so far is coming apart so well unlike the previous engine that I worked on if you look at the hole in the casting which takes this pin for the water pump it's not in the center of the shape part of the casting and if you look at the other parts of the casting the same thing applies. The thing that is totally unacceptable is the position of the main bearing shaft in the middle of the beam. It's offset to one side. So I'll try it with a soft hammer first and see whether it moves. Just as I thought, no chance at all. So it's over to the vise in the outer part of the workshop and a little bit of controlled ultraviolence. What I'm doing here is heating up the part because I'm pretty sure that this is held in with some kind of Loctite after applying the heat for a very short time and using a piece of copper tubing and some material in the vice jaws to protect the metal I can press the centre shaft into the position I want it to be in and I can confirm this by measuring it both sides. I don't know why the builders use Loctite on this component because if you look underneath the beam there are many holes and there was a grub screw in the centre one. The main shaft was held in place by a grub screw and I removed it but it was also very securely held by some Loctite as well, in the wrong position. When I refit the beam to the column, and move the beam up and down in the correct place, it is not 100% lined up with the piston. So I'm beginning to know what's gone on with this engine now. At first I thought it may be just a problem that the builder pressed in the main shaft with some Loctite and got it in the wrong position, and that was the end of it. But no, it was done on purpose to try and align the beam with the piston. It's not very far out now, but I do know what's going on. The trouble is though, you don't need to make too many errors on an engine to make a thorough mess of it. I'm tapping the holes to take the studs which will hold the outer main bearing in place. Whenever you're manually tapping a hole in a piece of metal, it's a case of two turns inwards and one turn outwards. If you don't do that and just power into the hole, you do stand a chance of getting the tap stuck and then it will snap off and that is not good. If you don't have much experience with taps, what I recommend you do is make a jig and it's just a little piece of bar turned in the lathe with a hole drilled down the middle which will allow the tap to pass through and that will keep the tap perfectly square with the hole. If you go into a hole like this at an angle, you're also likely to snap off the tap. Anyway, I've been doing this for a long time, so I don't really need to do that, and everything's okay. So once the hole is tapped, I then turn the pedestal upside down, and pardon the pun, I tap the pedestal on the bench to clear all the swarf out of the hole. So now I have a pedestal with holes drilled in the bottom to mount to the mounting base, and two threaded holes at the top. The top holes, of course, don't go all the way through. So what I need to do now is to make a couple of studs. I could either buy a long length of studding, which is quite expensive, or just machine down a couple of bolts. So I chose the latter option because it's cheaper and quicker. It's over to the lathe just to remove the head of the bolt. 
This steel is particularly hard stuff and it's quite difficult to cut through. But my little old Boxford seems to make short work of it. This old Boxford lathe is quite powerful and with the right cutting tool would actually remove a lot more metal but it would put a lot of strain on the machine. As I said earlier this stuff is really hard so I'm removing the metal quite slowly. And for those of you who like machining, here is some machining. I really do get quite a diverse cross section of comments on my videos from viewers. A lot of viewers complain that there isn't enough machining in the videos but I can only actually machine when I need to machine. I don't get up in the middle of the night and nip into the workshop to do any machining. It just has to be done when it has to be done. And on this job, most of the machining's already been done. I often wonder, you know, if famous filmmakers get the same problem. I wonder if anybody ever said to Stanley Kubrick, uh, well, Stanley, we really enjoyed your film Clockwork Orange, but we felt that there was not enough machining and general lathe work in it. Maybe that's why he withdrew the film in the first place. The good thing, of course, is once the bolt's head has been machined off, the stud will still be hard, so it will be a very good stud to hold the parts together. And here we have the finished pedestal with its studs fitted. And this is the top bearing going onto the studs. And those of you who are following this should now notice that the top cap is on the wrong way round and the main bearing itself is not machined equally at both ends. I will do something about that, but not for the moment. I need to carry on with the video. What I'm doing here is clamping down the crankshaft in the bearings. I need the crankshaft to be in its finished position here. So the first thing I do is tighten the main bearing on the bed plate and this will hold the crankshaft in its proper position. Then I slide the pedestal bearing onto the crankshaft and then also tighten the top cap on that bearing to hold it in position. And then I notice that the pedestal has been lifted off the baseboard and this is a general idea and if my measurements are correct this should be one eighth of an inch and these are temporary one eighth of an inch pieces of mahogany underneath the pedestal. I will probably change these packings for a piece of steel later on to give the pedestal a larger footprint on the base. After slackening off the top caps and giving them a bit of lubrication, I can spin the flywheel to see how concentrically it's running. I have of course just gently pinched at one of the grub screws. The whole crankshaft is oscillating from side to side, that will be put right when I put the packing pieces in. And now with this vast improvement in concentricity, it's time for me to go. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my Mainsteam Models website and click on the section of the website that says Video Playlists. And by doing that, you can find other videos that you may like to watch. And by using the playlists, you can actually watch the videos back to back.